Again, welcome. Uh, if you are new this morning, I'm Pastor Tim. Welcome to, to our church. This is our second service. This is the uh, more traditional service. The main difference is just the songs we sing, a little different than the first, song, uh, first uh, contemporary service. But we welcome you here this morning. Uh, we have been going through the books of the Bible, right? We started in Genesis, and we've gone book by book by book by book. And the purpose is to have a better understanding of what this book is all about. You know, uh, so many times, even Christians, we're not really maybe haven't been taught uh, what this is all about. What am I reading here? And so that's been the purpose. We've given an overview of each book. And some books are easier than others, some are more challenging than others, but we're going to continue that this morning, and we are in the book of Isaiah. Now Isaiah, uh, spoiler alert, is a, can be a tricky, challenging book because, first of all, there are 66 chapters in this book. So if we start now, we should be done in about five hours. I mean, so uh, I wouldn't do that to you. We're going to do it uh, a quick overview. It's just a brief overview. I will say that... Um, you might find it challenging because there's so much content in there, but stay with me, and I promise you, you have a better understanding of um, the book as a whole, and when you're reading it, you will know what's going on. And so as we begin every week with every book of the Bible, in this overview, uh, we'll kick it off author. Author of the book of Isaiah is prophet of Isaiah. We see that in Isaiah 1.1. Uh, and now there's some different scholarship that uh, over the years have question, well, is there a second author in the second half of the book? And you might have heard that. Just be aware of that. Uh, I would just say, you know, Jesus and John the Baptist, they frequently quote from Isaiah, and they say, as Isaiah says. So that's good enough for me. But nevertheless, just be aware of what's going on there. The date of the writing of the book of Isaiah, uh, between 739 and 681 uh, BC, and they can date these uh, according to the rulers and the kings and things like that of the time. Plus, we know about when Isaiah was around. And here's the big thing, like, okay, we're in the book of Isaiah. Uh, what was the purpose of the book of Isaiah? Why was Isaiah written? Well, the prophet Isaiah was called primarily to prophesy and speak to the king of Judah, right? And, and so they were going through a tumultuous time. As you know, there was this whole thing where they split. You have Israel and Judah, they split. Ten tribes and two tribes, kind of the civil war going on. And now is, or, or, um, Isaiah is proclaiming a message of repentance uh, to them because they have fallen away. They have not been faithful to God. Uh, and he's going to tell them a little bit about God's plan and for the future as well. So keep that in mind as we're going through. Real quick, here's a few high points in the book of Isaiah. Chapter 6, Isaiah's dramatic call. Chapter 25, a song of praise. Chapter 40, a description of God and his power over the earth. Chapter 52, a detailed description of God's ultimate plan. 53, a prophecy quoted about 10 times in the New Testament. And 55, a word of great comfort from God. So you can see some high points there as you go through in this. Now here's the thing. Um, the book of Isaiah is a very important book. Um, you know, you have big prophets, minor prophets, and things like that. Isaiah is like, I mentioned in the first service, like your Michael Jordan of prophets. I mean, he's, he is the big time. I mean, he, uh, out of all prophets in the Old Testament, is quoted more than in the New Testament by anybody else. I think 21 times or so, uh, he is quoted in, in um, the New Testament by people. Uh, you know how important Isaiah is? Uh, John the Baptist quotes from the book of Isaiah. You know, uh, Jesus, when he begins his ministry... Quotes from the book of Isaiah. If you remember, he opens a scroll. He reads about the Spirit being upon me to preach the Word. And he rolls the scroll up and says, and today this is fulfilled. And so this is a big time deal. And so they would be, especially in the New Testament, uh, looking to Isaiah for this. What is God doing? What is His plan? Where are things going? And we're going to see this here as we go through some of this. Uh, because Isaiah has some different words. If, if you really want to help follow along in the book of Isaiah, because this is not a per se easy book, if you're starting out especially, you can kind of divide the sections in two sections. Uh, the first section, it's condemnation. And so and Isaiah is going to be telling the people, listen, you are not being faithful to God. You're not remembering God. You're not worshiping God. You have turned your back on Him, and there is judgment being pronounced on them. Second half of the book of Isaiah, it's more a message of hope and what God is going to be doing. Uh, now, there's different things sprinkled throughout, but that just gives you a general idea as you follow the book of Isaiah. 
as we go through here. So let's kick it off. Uh, Isaiah chapters 1 through 12. Uh, this is Isaiah's call and messages of warning to Judah during the prosperous times of the kingdom. And so let's go to Isaiah chapter 1, uh, verses 1 through 4. It says this, The vision concerning Judah and Jerusalem that Isaiah, son of Amos, saw during the reigns of Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah, kings of Judah. Hear me, you heavens, listen, earth, for the Lord has spoken. I reared children and brought them up, but they have rebelled against me. The ox knows its master, the donkey its owner's manger, but Israel does not know my people do not understand. Woe to the sinful nation of people whose guilt is great, a brood of evildoers, children given to corruption. They have forsaken the Lord. They have spurned the Holy One of Israel and turned their backs on Him. And then verse 19, God says this, Stop bringing meaningless offerings. Your incense is detestable to me. New moon, Sabbath, and convocations, I cannot bear your worthless assemblies. What is going on here? A couple things. Um, number one, the people who were called by God for a purpose have turned their back on Him. They've, we see in the book that men are going around drunk and women care more about their appearance than, than people who are hungry. And they're, just, they're not fulfilling what God has called them to do. Right? And so God creates a people for a purpose, as we're going to see, but they've turned their backs. They've just turned selfish. They don't care. We even see here God saying, listen, you're doing all these things, like the incense and your offerings and sacrifices and whatever, and the worship, and like, wait a second, you, you told us to do this, what's the deal? And he says, I cannot bear your worthless assemblies. So these are people, they're doing all the ritualistic things, but God says, it's worthless. I don't want to, I, I can't even bear it anymore. And so a couple of things we can learn from this is, number one, as Christians, we, we got we to gotta be Christ-like. You know? We cannot be hypocrites. We cannot be one way in the church and go out and live a different way. Uh, Jesus frequently speaks against Christians that, uh, or followers, people that do that, that they proclaim they love God, but they go out and they live completely, completely different lives. Listen, God knows where we're at all the time. If we want to honor Him, we got to be true and faithful people. Now listen, we're not perfect. We all struggle. We all make mistakes. We're sinful people, right? We... we, uh, we, we, we rebel at times, and, but this is a, a constant kind of lifestyle. And so that's number one. Second thing is, notice, they're doing all the ritualistic things, but God is not pleased. So listen, just because you come to church, just because you, you know, quote-unquote believe, just because you, you know, give your tithes or you maybe serve or whatever you might be and you think God like, owes you something and pats you on the back, if your heart is not really in it, if you're not really a loving God and wanting to honor Him with your life, he knows it, and it's worthless to him that you're just going through the motions. You know, uh, Religion just says, do this and do this and go through the motions and your tickets punch. God says, listen, I want your heart. I want you to love me because I love you. Uh, when you realize how much I love you, God says, when you realize the, the lengths I've gone to bring you into a relationship with me, uh, then you, you can't help but love me. But sometimes what do we do? We, we neglect it. We forget it, and we just turn it into religiosity, going through the motions. And this is a big, big problem. Hip hypocrisy, not actually following God, and doing it in an empty way. Um, that's a big warning that we see Isaiah is giving to, to Judah and the surrounding, and he's proclaiming judgment. So chapter 3, we see uh, actually judgment on Jerusalem and Judah. We won't get too much into this, but I just say this. is uh, Sometimes when people see God judging, especially in the Old Testament, I hear all kinds of things like, oh man, that's harsh, that's mean, why would he do that, that's, you know, whatever. Uh, I would just say a couple things. Um, number one, very often when God judges nations, uh, it, it's for very specific reasons. So for example, there were groups of people that we see um, that were judged, whether it be the Canaanites or whatever, and people say, man, that's really harsh, why would God do that? But what you don't understand is these people are doing very awful, evil things. We know even from history, um, number one, even modern day historians, they're now finding bones of children in these um, societies' walls because they were doing child sacrifices. You know, they were doing awful, evil things. And God did give them a long, long time to repent and stop it. They did not. And finally, said God said, enough is enough. You know, what? that's one thing. Oftentimes people say, why is there so much pain and evil and suffering in the world? And uh, why doesn't God do something about it? Here, in different places, you have God stepping in and ending it. And then people say, that's too harsh. It's too rushed. 
You know, and so keep that in mind. Number two, realize is that God is God. Um, he doesn't owe us anything. He, he knows way more than we do. And for us trying to say what is the right thing to do is pretty, kind of arrogant. Uh, but, but, and thirdly, too, is God is not arbitrary. That God also judges his own people, as we're going to see. The Israelites, because they were not faithful, because they were doing evil, uh, will be held accountable for that. And so keep that in mind as he goes through, through that in chapter 3. Now here's the one, chapter 6. Um, Isaiah will be commissioned and called. This is now where God is calling Isaiah. So check this vision out, interesting vision. Isaiah chapter 6, verses 1 through 8 says this, In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord, high and exalted, seating on a throne, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him were seraphim, each six wings. With two wings they covered their faces, with two they covered their feet, and with two they were flying. Quite a wild scene we see there. And they were calling to each other, one another, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. The whole earth is full of His glory. At the sound of their voices, the doorposts and threshold shook, and the temple was filled with smoke. Woe to me, I cried, I am ruined, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips, and my eyes have seen the King, the Lord Almighty. Then one of the seraphim flew to me, the live coal in his hand, which he had taken with tongs uh, to the altar, or from the altar. With it, he touched my mouth and said, See, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away. Your sin is atoned for. Then I heard a voice saying, Lord, whom shall I send and whom will go for us? And I said, Here I am. Send me. So, first of all, it's quite a wild scene, you know, and, and so what's going on in this vision, and there's a lot of imagery and things like that. Let's not get bogged down with all that. Just to say a couple things. Um, number one is Isaiah was not some rube. Isaiah was very educated. Um, we know Isaiah actually served um, the, to mentor and to advise, rather, the kings, like four or five kings. So he was, he was like a well-known, smart, educated guy and um, could have had a little bit of arrogance about him. Maybe you would think in that society, having that kind of power or prestige. And what we see here is when he stands before God in this vision, what does he say? Woe to me. You know, he, he realizes, you know what? In the presence of God, his holiness, his perfection, it's, I'm in no comparison because I am not. You know, he says, I'm a man of unclean lips. I dwell with the people of unclean lips. He recognizes his sinfulness. He recognizes that God is perfectly holy, set apart, pure, other, other than we are. And he says, I, I'm not. And he realizes that. Uh, and so a couple things. It says, holy, holy, holy. God is other. He is perfectly loving, just, merciful. You know, we often think of God sometimes in terms of he's like, a nice grandpa in the sky, just kind of like shaking his finger at us when we do bad, or he's our buddy, or, you know, he doesn't really care much about, you know, when we rebel and things like that, or try to go against what he has best for us. Holy, 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 that really shows his, his magnitude, perfectly loving, perfectly just, perfectly other than. We can't even compare, um, but keep that in mind. Uh, and then he, he realizes, in, you know what, in front of God, when I stand before God, He's, he realized that I'm in trouble. Like, I cannot stand up on my own. Uh, and then it shows so actually he's cleansed. Uh, the coal on his lips, right? We see that kind of imagery. What does it say? That God is the one that will provide the salvation. God is the one that will do the cleansing and the redeeming, right? And so we see that. And then he says, whom shall I send? Look how he says, here I am, send me. What does it say? A couple things. First, Isaiah said, no, I can't do it. I'm unworthy. I'm a man of unclean lips. I dwell with people with unclean lips. What, what is it? If you've ever felt unworthy, if you feel like God cannot use you, I'm not smart enough, I'm not good enough, you don't know what I've done, you don't know my past, you don't know where I come from, that's nonsense. God can and does use everyone, no matter what your past is. Just look at the Old Testament, look at the New Testament. God is in the business of using imperfect people. You know, we're not perfect. So, and even in our midst of our shortcomings, God can and will use you for great, amazing things if you make yourself available. Because look what he says at the end. Here I am, send me. And so I just say this. If you ever felt that way, not good enough, that God could not use you, God could not love you, God could not forgive you, absolutely not. That we serve a God who is in the business of forgiving, redeeming, and using people for His glory, for His purpose to accomplish amazing things. And we can certainly learn that from the book of Isaiah. Because we see how Isaiah first 
resist and oh, I can't. I'm not, you know. But no, God is bigger than our, our past. God is bigger than our failures. God is bigger than anything we can think of in, in terms of that. And so he receives this call from God. And then we'll just jump around quickly here. Um, a couple of things. Go to Isaiah chapter 8. Um, we see this. Uh, 19 through 20, when someone tells you to consult mediums and spiritists who whisper and mutter, should not a people inquire of their God? Why consult the dead on behalf of the living? Consult God's instruction and the testimony of warning. If anyone does not speak according to the word, they have no light at dawn. And so real quickly, basically, um, King Ahaz, what is going on, he's consulting for advice because there's a lot of war going on. Consulting, what do we do? And um, they're consulting mediums and spiritists and even the dead. And Isaiah's like, hey, why don't you try God? Why don't you try the word? Uh, And so we see this in terms of he's seeking for guidance everywhere else but God. And that's really the question is, who are you consulting? You know, when you're trying to find out um, the answer is, of life, or the answers to problems, or the answers of even, say, morality, what is right and wrong. Who are you consulting, right? Uh, Because some celebrity says it's okay, or this is the way, because some politician or some law says it's okay. The reality is, who will you consult before those things? Because we live in a ton of different uh, information ages, rather, where you're being bombarded with people pulling you different ways, different places, and things like that. You have to ask, who has the authority? Because some celebrity says something, that makes it the way it is. Because some politician or whatever, as Christians, as people that want to honor God, it has to go back to God. Right? He is our source. He is our creator. He is the one that knows why he created us and his purpose, which we'll get into here in a second. But just keep that in mind. Who are you consulting? And then go to Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6, very popular verse for us. Um, For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders. He'll be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. And again, here's a little bit of a glimpse of Isaiah talking about this figure that's going to come. We, of course, if you're familiar, we see that as Jesus being the the Messiah going to come. Now people think, uh, who is this person that they're talking about here? Is it Jesus? Is it you know, a nation or, or, or whatever they're trying to ga- gather. I would just say a couple things. I wouldn't say a nation because it says he will be called. Um, and then also if you look at, he'll be called what? Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Uh, if you're a first century Jew, you don't just go around throwing around the term Mighty God, right? That's a very reverent term. You're not just going to go throwing around the term Mighty God to anybody and anyone. And so keep that in mind. But again, Isaiah is pointing to this figure that one day is going to come and fulfill what God is calling to do, or his plan to do, rather. But keep that in mind. Um, Chapter 10, real quickly, uh, we see God's hand in um, history. So essentially what happens is uh, God is going to use Assyria to judge his people. His people are not faithful, and so they're going to be handed over and taken over by the Assyrians. Uh, and you might think, well, that doesn't sound fair. Those Assyrians are surely worse than you know, the Israelites. Uh, they should be judged too. Well, as we will see, the Assyrians, for the awful, awful things they were doing, because they were just wiping people out right and left, they were all, God would also judge them too. But it just shows you God works in and through different ways to bring about his purposes. And it's not arbitrary. It's for a reason. His own people were judged for, uh, for uh, not doing what they're called to do. Uh, and then we're going to see this in a second. But... It's for a reason. Keep it in mind. It's for a reason. It's for a purpose. We'll see this here in a second. Now go on to Isaiah chapters 13 through 23. uh, This is Isaiah's messages to um, all the nations around Judah, including the enemies and close allies. And so essentially, keep in mind, Israel, the smaller nation, surrounded by big, big powerhouses, Assyria, Babylon, Egypt, that were just wiping people out. They're like, what do we do? I mean, like, what do we, how do we survive? And time and time again, Isaiah would tell the kings, listen, do not make allegiances with other countries, other nations. That's going to cause problems. Uh, But it was common back then. Like, you're a small nation. You need to find some big brother down here to help you that way hey if this nation attacks us you come you get them and then we'll give you money and stuff in exchange isaiah says listen trust god don't do that Um, but 
is too t- easier said than done sometimes. They do not. The, the king forms alliances, and eventually we see that actually causes more trouble than they think as they're under the oppression of, of him doing that. But Isaiah is just, he, he, he's reeling here because he grew up in such an amazing, prosperous time, and now people, they're falling away from God. They're falling away from who they were and what God has called them to be. And so we see this. But you might think, okay, well, who's this Isaiah character going around just you know, happily pronouncing judgment, and he wasn't doing that. So go to Isaiah chapter 16, look at this. So I weep at Jezer, as the Jezer weeps, uh, for the, wa- the vines of Sibma, Heshbon, and Ila. Uh, I dredge you with tears, uh, the shouts of joy over your ripened fruit and over your harvest have been steeled. And so what is happening here? He's, he's in pain, like, he breaks his heart to be saying this. He's weeping over this. He's not joyful about this. This is someone, even for people, like, look, go to the book of Ezekiel. It says, even God does not rejoice in the death of the wicked. It's not a happy thing, a positive thing. Uh, but he's saying, listen, uh, my heart is breaking, but you're missing it. God has something so beautiful for you, but you're missing what is going on here. And uh, go to Isaiah 21, even goes forth. Isaiah 21. At this, my body is racked with pain. Pang sees me like those of a woman in labor. I am staggered by what I hear. I am bewildered by what I see. And keep in mind, uh, the Middle East was a very tumultuous time, even much like today. Nation would go into the nation and just wipe them out. And so there's war going on. There's killing going on. And he said, I'm just in so much pain here. His heart is breaking. Uh, But... This is what it says. Even though they're going through this painful time, and we know from history, just even um, sources outside of the Bible, this is a very, very hard time. Uh, We know that even they were going through this, they were wondering what? Where is God at? You'll you'll find, read the Old Testament, frequently they say, God, where are you at? Why don't you show up? Why don't you fulfill your promises? We're being decimated here. Where are you at, God? Have you forgotten us? But what Isaiah is saying is, even though it might look like it, do not give up hope. God is still at work. And even when things look the bleakest, even when things look so awful, realize God will fulfill his promises. And even in your life right now, if you're going through a hard time, a challenging time, we live in challenging times now. And say, even though things look bad in this world, even though things might look bad in your personal life, God will fulfill a promise. God will restore all things. And we're going to see this in a second. So do not lose hope. Uh, in Isaiah 24 to 35 now, chapters, this now is a future view of earth's future um, and a specific message to Judah and Assyria's people. Now, a couple of things. Again, reading Isaiah can be challenging because Isaiah will frequently zoom in up close to like his current circumstances and then zoom out to like a future view of what God is going to do. So keep that in mind as he's going through here. But check this out. Isaiah 25, verse 6 through 8, says this. On this mountain, the Lord Almighty will prepare a feast of rich food for all peoples, a banquet of aged wine, the best of meats, the finest wines. On this mountain, he will destroy the shroud that enfolds all peoples, the sheet that covers all nations. He'll he'll swallow up death forever. The sovereign Lord will wipe away tears from all faces. He'll remove his people's disgrace from all the earth. The Lord has spoken. what kind of God is this? You know, people have different views of God. He's an angry bully. He's mean. He's far away. He's absent. He's distant. This is a God that says, will wipe away all tears from your eyes. So if anything you can say about the God revealed in Scripture, He is not a God who's far away, absent, and does not care. He's a God who loves you, who created you for a purpose, who wants you to return to Him, who one day wipe away the tears from all faces. Like, what kind of God does it? He's the God that revealed in Jesus is like your heavenly Father who loves you, who cares for you, who knows what's best for you. But many times, what do we do? Sinful, we say, no, I know what's best, and we try to be Lord of our own lives. And God says, listen, I love you, I trust you, trust me, I know what's best for you. I use the analogy all the time, but if you have little kids, and your little kid, your child asks for to have 
two bags of Oreos for breakfast. And you're just like, no, that's not a good idea. Why? Not because you're mean or trying to spoil their fun, because you love them. You know what's best for them. So when God tells us no for certain things, he's not trying to be a killjoy or spoil your fun. He's saying, listen, I created you. I love you. I know what's best for you. Will you trust me? Because sin destroys. Sin is, is a, a violation of purpose, and it leads to destruction. Not only in this life, but ultimately when you refuse to, to walk with God. But also look at this. It says, he will swallow up death forever. This is one of the few pictures we see in the Old Testament that talks about God is going to end death. right? And we see in Jesus, right? when Jesus is raised again, death is over. Like, like Death does not have the final say. God has overcome the grave, and all of those who follow him will one day be raised again. That's one of the beautiful pictures we see, that, that if you read the New Testament, that the evidence of who Jesus is and God's plan is that Jesus is called the first fruits of this. He is raised to a new glorified body. And all Christians will one day, too, be raised to life, that death is not, have not the final say. God will not allow that to be the final say. Now, death enters because of, of sin and, and the violation of, of um, uh, when things happen, the things got messed up, right? Because the Bible talked about that. The Bible shows us who we are, where we came from, how things got messed up, and what God is doing to fix it. So that helps you give a better thing into perspective. But look what kind of God this is. Passionate for his people, loves for his people. And so when people are harming themselves, harming others, it breaks his heart, and he has to do something about it. He goes through immeasurable lengths to bring his people back to himself. Isaiah 26, 3, 4 says this, you will keep in perfect peace those whose minds are steadfast because they trust you. Trust in the Lord forever. For the Lord, the Lord himself is the rock eternal. Uh, perfect peace for those who trust. The question is this. What, do you, what are you trusting in? Who are you trusting in? Everyone is trusting in someone or something. You know? Uh, everybody. Everybody. Whether it's your own intellect or your own smarts or some people trust in science. Listen, I love science. Science is good. I'm very much pro-science. I think actually science points and proves the existence of God. We've talked about different ways in the past. But science will never explain why is there something rather than nothing. What is the meaning and purpose of life? What kind of scientific formula is going to explain love? Was going to explain right and wrong? You know, you know when you see human rights violated, when you see innocent people killed, your hearts cry out for that. What scientific thing says that's wrong? The, the, the questions of meaning and purpose and morality, those are metaphysical questions. They go far beyond just atoms and molecules and things like that. Uh, I love those things, but I think even DNA information, you know, where does information come from? Uh, and so what are you putting your trust and faith into? This says there is far more beyond than maybe you are realizing and thinking. And we've talked about it in the past. We've actually given the evidences and studies for the existence of God and the resurrection of Jesus. We'll do it again in the future. But just keep this in mind. What are you trusting in? If you're trusting in your bank account, if you're trusting in your appearance, in your job, your status, uh, that's sinking sand because those things will not last, right? And so what are you putting your faith into? Everyone's putting your... The question is, what is the Lord of your life? Everyone has the Lord of your life. It's just a matter of what is that. And then go on. Uh, and so, again, Isaiah is trying to pull his people back from a spiritual slump. They have fallen away from following God. They are just in danger of, of not fulfilling what God has called them to do. And so we see this going on here. Uh, go to Isaiah 36, 39. This is kind of tells of great crises um, faced by King Hezekiah. Uh, the focus kind of moves from the book of Assyria and, and to the Babylons. Uh, this is, you know, it covers a lot of history, put it that way. And this is some of those challenging times in Isaiah's ministry and life, uh, in, in the kings as well. Isaiah, uh, about 50 years he was preaching for, this, and advised king after king after king, well-known guy, uh, but there's a lot of challenges faced. Go to Isaiah chapter 40 through 48. Now, these are prophecies addressed to a different situation. It's about 200 years into the future. Now Babylon, not Assyria, is a great enemy. Now notice this though. Now things shift a little bit. Where the first half, Isaiah is condemning and warning and saying, listen, you people are not 
doing what is right. You are not honoring God. You've turned your back on him. Now, and the, there's judgment and there's, there's consequences to that. Um, now, look how it starts off. Isaiah 40, verse 3. A voice of one calling in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord, make straight in the desert a highway for the Lord. That's an interesting verse. Where have we heard that before? In the New Testament. That is what John the Baptist starts off, right? John the Baptist, cousin of Jesus, starts off citing from the book of Isaiah, saying he, essentially, is the voice in the wilderness. And what is he calling the people to do? Repentance from sin, right? Turning from a self-centered way of living and turning towards a God-centered way of living. And so we see him doing that. Now go on to Isaiah 40, verse 31. But those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. They will soar on the wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not be faint. Now, this is very real-life application to these people, for, for number one, because they're living in a war-torn time. And not only that, the Israelites have been scattered now across the Middle East. You know, from the Assyrians to the Babylonians, they've been dispersed. And now the question the Jews will be asking themselves is, where is God at? Has he not fulfilled his promise? Has he abandoned us? Can you feel that? Like, you have to really feel. And so Isaiah is speaking a message of hope. Listen, it might look bad. It might look terrible. But listen, God is not done yet. Just wait and see what he's going to do. You know? And he explains the hope that the Jews have. Not only for just the Jews, but for the whole world, as we're going to see here in a second. Uh, because if you remember, God rose up the Israelites for a purpose, right? He had a chosen people for a purpose to make his name known, and to bring people back into a relationship with him. So God raises up the chosen people, brings them into the promised land, to bring forth the promised Messiah, to redeem a fallen and broken world. And that's a nutshell um, explanation of you read the whole entire Old Testament. And that helps you kind of get, grasp what the storyline is, what God was doing in, in that through history here. And, and so we see this, the same questions they had. But he says, listen, those who open the Lord renew their strength. Where is your hope? Where is your faith? Where is your trust? And, and again, faith is not just a blind leap. First of all, everyone's putting their faith into something. We've been through this before. Everyone is putting their faith into something. I don't care whatever their belief system is. It's, you're putting your faith in something. But biblical faith is having good reason for believing what you believe. And that's why we talked about apologetics before, is examining why we believe what we believe, the evidence for it, um, different topic. But, but keep this in mind as we go forth. Uh, but now, as we go through, well, wait a second. What are the great hopes that Isaiah is speaking to his people about? Well, really, there's, there's three that you can go. First, Isaiah is speaking of a hope about getting free from Babylon captivity. Remember, they were in captivity from Babylon. What does Isaiah say? Isaiah prophesies that there will be a leader that rises up named Cyrus, and he will let the people return to their, their homeland. And I can't remember the years, but this was written probably, I think it was 700 years before, but it might have been a little less, but it was hundreds of years, I believe, if my memory serves me correct, before this even was a possibility. And so what happened? All those years later, Cyrus of Persia comes to power, and what happens? He allows the Jews to go free and return to their homeland. That, that is fulfilled. So that's hope number one, freedom from Babylonian captivity. That's the short term. Second hope we see there's this mysterious figure Isaiah keeps talking about, the servant that God is going to use to redeem the world, to uh, establish his kingdom forever. Uh, this is a very mysterious thing that to them would have been. Now, we look back and realize it's fulfilled in Jesus, but they wouldn't have known that. So they're wondering, where is this going to be fulfilled? Where is this hope, the servant, coming from? And then the third hope that we see in Isaiah is there is hope for the whole world. God is not going to allow this mess to go on forever, right? We all know this in our hearts. Like, the world is broken. Something is wrong. Something is messed up. It shouldn't be this way. And the Bible says, no, it shouldn't be this way. Something happened to mess things up. But the good news is the gospel is God is working through Israel and then ultimately through Jesus to bring about a saving of the world, a restoration of the world. And Isaiah and the rest of the New Testament talks about one day God is going to restore the entire world to to the way it was intended to be. You often wonder, why do we feel the world shouldn't be this way? 
that's one of the questions. There's so much pain and evil and, and stuff going on in the world. Surely this can't be how God intended it. The Bible says, no, it's not how God intended it. But here's the question. If, if you operate with a naturalist mentality, and naturalists basically just say, there's only physical things, there's nothing beyond this, right? If that's your mentality of, of naturalism and uh, survival of the fittest and things like that, why are you outraged when the weak are slaughtered? Because survival of the fittest, that's how things work. The, 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 the strong kill the weak every day. So why are you outraged and feel it shouldn't be that way? The, the reality is we feel that way because we know it shouldn't be that way. There's more, right? And so same way with pain. You step on a nail, ow, it hurts, it tells us something's wrong. Same way we know something is wrong, it shouldn't be this way, because it shouldn't be this way. God programmed that into us like a GPS to know, no, you were created for more, there is more, there shouldn't be, it shouldn't be this way. Uh, and the good news is, God is not going to allow it to go on forever. He will one day restore all things the way intended to be. And we see this beautiful picture as we go forward. But keep that in mind as we, as we go forth. Now, as the, we're almost there, almost done. It's going to come together. Check this out. Go to Isaiah 45, or 45 through 55, 49. This is, it. Um, this is the word of hope about the final deliverance through the suffering servant. So go to Isaiah 49, says this. He says, It is too small a thing for you to be my servant to restore the tribes of Jacob and bring back those of Israel I have kept. I will also make you a light for the Gentiles, that's non-Jews, that my salvation may reach to the ends of the earth. This is God's plan is for the entire earth. So God starts off by raising up the Israelites to be a light. That way people know who the true God is and their purpose. Um, you might think, well, wait a second. Uh, is this something new to Isaiah? No. This starts all the way back in the book of Genesis. Go to Genesis chapter 22, the very first book of the Bible. The angel of the Lord called to Abraham from heaven a second time and said, I swear by myself, declares the Lord, that because you have done this and have not withheld your son, your only son, I will surely bless you and make your descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky and as the sand on the seashore. Your descendants will take possession of the cities of their enemies and through your offspring, all nations on earth will be blessed because you have obeyed me. You know, Isaiah, God is... God has called the Israelites for a purpose, to, to make his name known, to help bring people back into a relationship. Here's the thing. The Israelites time and time again failed at this. You see, they, they, would, they would rebel, they'd turn to false gods, God would deliver them over into uh, captivity, they'd repent, and then before you know it, they'd do it again, repeat. And so we see in Jesus' day, the Jews were not being the light that God had called them to be. Instead of being very inclusive, they became very exclusive, you know? Uh, so you could, the non-Jews couldn't go to the temple, and they had all these new rules and regulations and rituals. And Jesus spoke against these religious elites, saying, listen, you people don't know the heart of God. You're doing all the ritualistic things, but you do not know God. You do not know things like mercy and sacrifice and things like that. Uh, and, and so what we see here is God's plan all along was going to be use the Israelites, to be a light to the world, the nations. We even see in the New Testament the, the, the parable about the king inviting people to the banquet. Remember that story? And what happens, the first people that are invited, they say, no, I'm too busy, I don't want to have it. And then he invites everyone else on the street. Kind of a good analogy of the Israelites, Jews, first to them. Many of them rejected it. And, and then now it's open to the Gentile world. But, but just keep in mind as you read, that gives you some perspective to, to some of this. Uh, and now go on to Isaiah 52. How beautiful on the mountains are the feet of those who bring good news, who proclaim peace, who bring good tidings, who proclaim salvation, who say to Zion, your God reigns. So he's saying, man, how good it is to bring this good news to people who desperately need it. Now listen, we live in pretty comfortable Western society, you know. You might think, well, I got money in my bank account, I got a good job, I, I got clothes, uh, I'm pretty secure. But when you have a people who are being oppressed, being slaughtered, being killed, do you don't think they're going to desperately want some good news? 
that listen, the good, the, go, the gospel, gospel means good news, right? The good news, God created you, God loves you, he has a purpose for you, he enters in the world in through Jesus Christ and suffers and dies for you, he overcame the grave, and one day he's going to restore all things to the way it was intended to be, and all those who humble themselves and walk with him are going to be part of that. That's pretty good news. Now if you're comfortable and just in America, you're like, ah, I take it or leave it, Go to Africa where there's a child right now digging through the garbage for the next meal or afraid that someone's going to come in and wipe them out in genocide. You don't think they're going to be longing for God to do something and step up and right all wrongs? You better believe it. And so God offers hope for a broken, fallen world that nothing else can offer. But keep that in mind as we go through. We're almost, we're almost there. Now go to um, Paul actually says the, same, Paul says the same thing. Go to Romans 10, New Testament. Paul talks about this. Um, his joy of preaching the gospel. Romans 10, 14 to 15. How then can they call on the one they have not believed in? And how can they believe in the one whom they have not heard? And how can they hear without someone preaching to them? And how can anyone preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. The gospel. You know, as Christians, we got to make sure we communicate the gospel in a way that makes sense to people. That's good news. Not bad news. Okay, if you don't believe in Jesus, you're going to hell. Like, that's, that's, not, that's not the way you should present it. It doesn't even make sense to people. Present it in a way, listen, God loves you, and he has gone through, has a purpose for you, and has gone through a great deal, so you know who he is, and will come to him and walk with him, because he is your heavenly father. Uh, and so keep that in mind, and we go through. Um, real quickly, almost done. Uh, now the popular verses in Isaiah 52, we have the suffering servant. Isaiah 52, about the suffering servant again. Go to the wounded healer in Isaiah 53, about, again, this, this mysterious character that's going to um, inaugurate God's kingdom. And then the end of it all, peace with God at last, Isaiah 55, we see like, kind of a beautiful picture of that. And then lastly, go to Isaiah 56, 66 chapters. Um, this is a general warning to Judah in a view of the future. Um, I will just say, I'm not going to read it for time's sake, so you can skip through the next few verses. Isaiah 56, 6 through 7, you can skip from it. But basically, the verse talks about this is, um, before the foreigners and, and the Gentiles, they were excluded. Now, in this new phase, it's, it's for everyone. They're all included. That God's plan is for the world, right? God's plan to redeem, redeem the world. And they will be redeemed in this. And so now God's promises now will be exalted through that um, house of prayer. And go to Isaiah 58, 58, 6 through 10. Again, not going to read it. You can skip through it for time's sake. Basically, if you read this, it goes back to the way Isaiah started things. Your religion is being empty. Quit with your empty worship. Quit with your empty assemblies. You know, you might come here and sing some songs and toss some money in the plate, but if you go out of here and live differently, not honoring God, it's empty. It's worthless. He's saying you need to get back to a true model of what it looks like to live a life of God where you're loving God, loving others, where people encounter you and they experience your love and your joy. Not, not, not false uh, Christianity, not false worshiping God, but we see this. Um, it, it's basically what Jesus does. Jesus speaks out against this kind of hypocrisy, religion, and 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 um, looking down upon your noses. We all need God's mercy and grace and forgiveness. Every single one of us. Okay, here it is. Lastly, we're going to finish it up. Beautiful picture of what God is leading to. Isaiah 65, 17 through 20. See, I will create new heavens and a new earth. The former things will not be remembered, nor they will come to mind, but be glad and rejoice forever in what I will create. For I will create Jerusalem to be a delight, and its people a joy. I will rejoice over Jerusalem and take delight in my people. The sound of weeping and crying will be heard no more. What a beautiful picture that God is one day going to end all pain, all suffering, all death, all crying. Something that our hearts know shouldn't even be that way to begin with, because we're kind of programmed that way. And guess what? We see this picture in Revelation. Fast all the way forward, last book of the Bible, Revelation. What is, what's the picture? The new Jerusalem coming down, right? Uh, Christ reigning, uh, all things being restored. What does Jesus say? Behold, I make all things new, right? There'll be no more weeping, no more crying, no more death, no more pain. Jesus says, for the old order of things has passed away. 
And behold, I make all things new. It's Revelation. And again, drawing on this idea of what God is doing, where things are leading, God um, is not going to, to end things. I would just say this too. And you look at Isaiah and some different prophecies. You see things about Cyrus. You see things about other prophecies predicted well, well before anyone could even have known. Fulfilled, fulfilled, fulfilled. You think this is going to be any different? <laughs> You've been good so far, you know, fulfilled after fulfilled. Um, this is also going to come to pass one day. And so do not lose hope. Whatever you're going through, however bad things look, God loves you, God has a plan for you, and things will be restored and redeemed one day. And if you actually go to Isaiah 66, it's not up there, but it actually touches upon um, pain with a purpose. That just because you're a Christian and believe in God or, or whatever, doesn't mean your life's going to be easy. Because again, we live in a broken, fallen world. We live in a sinful world. People make bad choices to harm other people. You know, we make dumb choices. Uh, and sometimes. And so uh, we see even Jesus say, expect for Christians persecution and hard times and troubles. Uh, but I would just say this. In the New Testament, we see, number one, God can still bring good out of evil. Not that God is causing evil, but he can still bring good out of evil. Okay. Uh, and number two, there are times we even see when God is in, uh, initiating judgment, for example, uh, in the Old Testament for the people that are doing evil. God can still do that to bring about a purpose. It's, it's pain with a purpose. It, it, it is, uh, it's kind of like, think about childbirth, for example. Childbirth, very painful, uh, but at the end, it brings forth something beautiful, something good. Uh, and so keep that in mind, uh, that you might go through hard times and challenges, but God will not abandon you, and things are going towards one day when God restores all things um, as intended. That was a lot. I know. 66 chapters. I get it. You guys have been highly educated now as scholars of the Isaiah Bible. Uh, I would just say this. is I know this is maybe not the most um, charismatic message, if you will. You know, I like to have fun and do fun messages and, and more simple. It was, this was a very informative message. But I wanted to do that because I want you to better know what in the world is going on in the Bible. I want you to know what was going on in the grand scheme of, of what God is doing and has done. Because when you open the book, when you read it, now you're better equipped to know what in the world is going on instead of saying, eh, I don't, what, what is happening? What's going on? Put this in your tool belt, apply it, and study it so you can know more. But it's not just information too. It needs to affect your spirit as you want to go forth and live how God has called us to, to live. So let's pray. Heavenly Father God, we thank you for this day and everybody here. God, as we read the book of Isaiah, there's so much in there. God, help us to, number one, better understand it from a bigger perspective of, of your plan working through Israel to bring forth the Messiah to redeem a broken, fallen world. And God, help us to avoid the mistakes they had made by not actually walking with you by turning their back on you. Let us never get so comfortable or arrogant that we do that. God, we know we're all sinful. We all make mistakes. We all need your mercy and grace. And God, we humbly ask you to guide us and lead us. Everybody here, Father, we know we can't save ourselves. We need your forgiveness. We need your mercy and grace. We have the same mentality and mindset of Isaiah as he stood before you and said, woe is me because we can't even compare to your perfect holiness and justice, God. All of us have sinned. All of us have rebelled. God, we know the good news is, though, that you love us. You have a purpose for us. You've died for us. You've overcome the grave. And one day you're going to restore all things. And to be a part of that, it simply takes to humble ourselves. Humble ourselves and say, God, will you save me? And then to repent, to turn from a self-centered way of living and turn towards a God sin we're living. And God, right now, if anyone here is going through challenges or struggles, or even looking at the world the way it is, Father, let them take hope in you and nothing else, because we know you're faithful, and our hope does not lie in this world, because nothing will satisfy. Try to find it in power, pleasure, money. It's not going to satisfy. So the celebrities will tell you that if you go on YouTube and watch their videos. It feels empty. There's got to be more to life than this because you've designed us with that in our heart. Father, let us seek you, walk with you in faith. 
And if anyone is here this morning and you've never made a commitment to follow Christ with your life, you can do that now. You might have a lot of questions. You might not fully understand everything. But just know that God loves you. Christ died for you. And He wants you to turn to Him. So if you want to turn to Him today and you want to ask Him to save you, you just pray along with me now. Just say, Heavenly Father, silent, and you can do it silently. Father God, I know I need Your mercy and grace. I know I need Your forgiveness. I can't save myself. Like everyone here, I've sinned, I've fallen short, I've tried to be God of my own life. God, I ask you to forgive me. I ask you to save me. Your word says that everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. Father, I'm asking you to save me. And God, I'm trusting in what you've done in your son Jesus Christ, that he died on the cross for me. He was raised again, defeating death. And because of that, we do not have to grieve like the rest of mankind who have no hope, your word says. And Father, I want to commit to repent, to turn from my sinful ways of trying to be God of my own life and turn towards walking with you because I know you're my heavenly Father and you love me and you know what's best for me and now I'll flourish more in doing that and who I was created to be. God, I pray you guide me and lead me, but I'm asking you to save me. We thank you and praise you, God. In Jesus' name, amen.